a legendary star maker. Phil was very, very determined. With a dark past. He got up and he backhanded me with the pistol again and said, I told you to take your effing clothes off. He began to think he's God with, with a mixed up brain. A beautiful actress trying to keep her Hollywood dreams alive. She never got that big break. And a tragic curtain call that would leave all of Los Angeles guessing. You formed an opinion of George is guilty. The inside story on the rock and roll hit maker and his celebrity murder trial. Tonight on Power, Privilege and Justice. Around 5 a.m. on a Monday morning, police raced to the home of Phil Spector, the famous Pyrenees Castle, located in Alhambra, just east of downtown L.A. They had to secure the outside of the property. It was a rather large piece of property. And then when they went to the house, Spector was inside. And they could see the silhouette of a man on the second floor walking around. So they're aware that there was someone alive upstairs. As officers prepare to storm the castle, Spectre suddenly appears at the back door. Phil Spectre was telling the police to come in, saying, you know, you, you won't believe what you're going to see. They told him to put his hands up, which he did, but then he kept putting his hands back in his pocket. Police fear he's reaching for a gun. So they taser him, but the taser doesn't work. It misfires. They try again, and it misfires. Inside, they find 40-year-old actress Lana Clarkson, dead from a gunshot wound to the head. Lana Clarkson was slumped over in a chair, blood flowing out of her mouth onto the right side of her dress. Beneath her left ankle, the weapon that presumably killed her. The gun itself, which was a, a snub-nosed 38 Colt Cobra revolver, appeared to have been wiped down. Officers note that the 62-year-old Spectre smells of alcohol and appears intoxicated. He offers up a rambling explanation of what happened. And Phil Spectre said it was a mistake, it was an accident, she works at the House of Blues, that he could explain. Something had happened. It wasn't his fault, but she was dead, and he was terribly sorry for her. But the scene in the living room raises eyebrows. There were some liquor bottles, and there were candles. There was even some soft music playing. So clearly it was a romantic setting. They thought it could have been a sexual crime in nature, that perhaps that this was some tryst that had gone awry. But she had refused his advances, and that he had shot her. But Spectre has another explanation. He says, I don't even know this woman, and she has the, basically, the audacity to come into my house and blow her brains out. He ended up starting to blame her for being in his house, almost as if she were some ungrateful guest who had committed the faux pas of committing suicide in his foyer. It's very dramatic. It's, it was almost cinematic in its um, quality. It was as if you were seeing a film noir movie. Police don't buy the story and arrest Spectre on the spot, setting off a media firestorm. Phil Spectre is perhaps the most influential record producer in history. 
and worked with everyone from the Ronettes to the Ramones to the Beatles. Phil Spector is an interesting person, even if people have never heard of him, they've heard the music. His contribution to music is legendary, and he is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I first met Phil Spector in 1987 in New York at a high society party in his honor in the private room of Mortimer's. Phil captivated the fashionable crowd that night. He was hot stuff. Now Phil Spector was handcuffed in the back of a police car and his castle was crawling with cops. A psychedelic carnival of cops, coroners, people, medical examiners. Investigators search every inch of the 8,500 square foot, 10 bedroom castle and make some disturbing finds. There were blood smears on the door, on the uh, nearby stairwell. There was a cloth diaper that was found in an adjacent bathroom that appeared to have been wetted and it had a lot of blood on it. They also found a lot of guns. Most of them were loaded. Meanwhile, Spectre is booked and questioned at the Alhambra police station. He was ranting and raving and saying that she did it, that she had shot herself in the temple, calling her a, a lot of horrible names. And he demonstrated to one of the officers what happened. And he said that she took the gun. Basically, he demonstrated, put it to her head. And then he, he jerked his head back. Investigators are shocked by Spectre's behavior. He'd uh, been finally coming down from whatever he'd been drinking by then. And I'm sure he was coming out of a bit of a fog. And I think it was just then that he realized that how deeply in trouble he was. As reality sinks in, Spectre hires famed O.J. Simpson attorney Robert Shapiro to help get him out of jail. Robert Shapiro basically was able to set up a wall of publicity around Spectre. It sort of gave Spectre's people the ability to spin a narrative about this incident. There were no eyewitnesses, and that's always a big problem. Usually you assume the other person has done it, but that's not always the case. The strategy works, and Spectre is released on $1 million bail. The music tycoon then is whisked off to the exclusive Bel Air Hotel, and L.A. sinks its teeth into what appears to be another celebrity murder. This is uh, a city of bread and circuses, and so the, the death of Lana Clarkson, coupled with Spectre, allowed this carnival atmosphere to seep back into the life of uh, the media and uh, celebrity watching in Los Angeles. You start thinking, oh my, there's going to be a trial and we're going to find out things we didn't know. And that's what happened in this case. It took on a life of its own and it was very different than we had first assumed. The murder charges may have come as a surprise to some people, but not to me. After everything I'd heard about Phil Spector and guns over the years, it almost seemed inevitable. The public is shocked when 40-year-old actress Lana Clarkson is found shot to death inside Phil Spector's castle. Friends and associates of the legendary music producer are not. But it wasn't a, a big surprise because it was almost like a, a, a ticking time bomb going off. But what happened that night with Lana remains a mystery. An autopsy shows that she died instantly when a gun discharged inside her mouth. Lana Clarkson's blood alcohol level froze at the time of her death, and that was 0.12. It's over the legal limit, say, for driving, and she had some Vicodin in her system. Tests reveal extensive gunshot residue on Lana's hands, but just two tiny particles on Spectre. The prosecution believed that Phil Spector was responsible for her death. Even if her hands were on the gun at the time, they say she was trying to get it out of her mouth or away from her. It was an incident waiting to happen. You wave guns enough, you point them at people, sooner or later, things happen. 
Phil Spector's bizarre life began in 1940 in New York City. It wasn't a fairy tale childhood. His beloved father committed suicide while he was just in grade school. At age 12, Phil moved out to Los Angeles with his mother and sister. Southern California in the late 50s was a, an amazing land of opportunity. It was a place where um, fame seemed to be around every corner. At 17, he formed a rock and roll band called the Teddy Bears. In 1958, they had a number one hit with a song Spectre wrote, To Know Him Is To Love Him. Carol Connors, a two-time Oscar-nominated songwriter, was the band's lead singer. Those were his moments of purity. To know him was that one shining moment when it's all opening up for you. The title that has a special meaning because it was later discovered that on the tombstone of his father was the phrase, to know him is to love him. In 1960, after the band's breakup, Spectre moved to New York City and set up shop at the celebrated Brill Building, the hub of America's music business at the time. He was changing what people listened to in America. He was changing the sound of music. And it was exciting, and it was just like nothing anyone had ever heard before. He had a brash sensibility and a, a desire to completely change the ambition of the music industry around him. Spectre's secret lay in his so-called wall of sound, a dense layered effect that reproduced well on AM radio. And cram in all the, uh, you know, number of guitarists, uh, multiple bass players, orchestra, and with the tricks of the studio, the echo, the reverb, that sort of thing, it would create this symphonic roar. It jumped out of the radio and it became as he called it, symphonies for teens. By 21, Spectre was a millionaire. He moved back to L.A., bought an elaborate 32-room mansion in Beverly Hills surrounded by iron gates and barbed wire fences and continued to cultivate his signature sound. But with all of the money and fame, he only became more and more overbearing. He had the attitude that I am Phil, I'm important, and it's about me. So he had tantrums. He would scream at people and occasionally he would wave guns around. Sometimes I would see him with guns, you know. He'd come in the studio and flip him around and, you know, everyone would laugh or duck or whatever. In 1966, Spectre crafted what he thought was his masterpiece, the single River Deep Mountain High by Ike and Tina Turner. She considered his epic, the pinnacle of his achievement, as an audio auteur, and nobody cared. The song failed to crack Billboard's top 40. All of a sudden, he wasn't invincible anymore in the record industry. He gave up. He felt that he had done the best thing he could possibly do. The musical mastermind withdrew from the public eye and retreated behind the walls of his Beverly Hills estate. He was just eccentric, strange, reclusive. He would, quote unquote, hold court. In 1968, Spectre married his longtime girlfriend, Ronnie Bennett, lead singer of the Ronettes. He was very controlling. She basically became a prisoner in their Beverly Hills mansion wouldn't let her leave the place, wouldn't let her do anything. She was telling me that he had put a coffin, a gold coffin, in the a, a mansion and would bring it down there and say to her, this is where you're going to be, at gunpoint. At a John Lennon recording session, Spectre went so far as to actually pull the trigger. As Phil has the gun up in his hands, like this, and he goes, well, you can't tell me what to do. And I see John with his finger in his ear going, uh, he goes, Phil, Phil, if you're going to shoot me, shoot me. But don't mess with me ears because I need them. I remember Phil as brilliant, fascinating to talk to, and sometimes scary. It was a well-known fact at that time that he had pulled guns on people. I personally know two women 
who claimed they'd been held prisoner in his house for several days. He carried a gun when we saw each other, but he never pulled it on me. There were no checks and balances, so somebody didn't say, hey, Phil, do you think you could put that gun away? I think he saw guns as a way to make himself seem bigger and more important and maybe a little scarier than he really was. As years drifted on, he became almost a curio figure. He was more famous for his tantrums, for his eccentricities, than he was for his latest hits. In 1998, Spectre moved into the mansion that would eventually serve as the backdrop to the murder investigation. Spectre's Pyrenees Castle, as he named it, stood on a hill in Alhambra in a community where you really wouldn't expect it to be found. It's really a very middle-class community. Phil Spector's castle was something out of Sunset Boulevard, uh, mixed with a bit of Tim Burton. The Pyrenees Castle was as pretentious and peculiar as its owner. And now both would forever be linked to Lana Clarkson's mysterious demise. What really happened in the castle that night? I, I had to find out for myself. After Lana Clarkson's death, it's up to a Los Angeles County pathologist to determine whether it was a homicide or a suicide. They also have to look at her, her state of mind, what was going on in her life that day, the weeks and months before. Lana Clarkson was born in 1962 in Long Beach, California. As a teenager, she began pursuing a career as a model and actress. Lana was beautiful. I mean, she was statuesque, she was blonde, gorgeous, stunning. She got off to a promising start with small parts in the movies Scarface and Fast Times at Ridgemont High and more than 50 TV shows. Lana's biggest role was the 1985 Roger Corman film Barbarian Queen, and she did a sequel to that as well. She was over six feet tall and exquisite and was able to handle guns. She could do all the stunts, she could do all the physical things. And I know that Roger Corman loved her in the movie. Like a character out of Nathaniel West's great Hollywood novel, The Day of the Locust, Lana landed several good parts in B films, but stardom eluded her. This is a woman who really wanted to be a star, who really did have talent. And she had a lot of range. But she never got that big break. In January 2003, to make ends meet, Lana took a job manning the velvet rope at the House of Blues Foundation Room. The Foundation Room is a private section of the nightclub, a private room, where big top celebrities and executives can come. They're catered to incredibly, and they're expected to leave very big tips. This was a pretty plum assignment. She thought that she might be rubbing shoulders with people who may know her or could help her. Just weeks into the job, Lana welcomed an aging record producer to the club. Hours later, she would be dead. It just seemed like a fateful meeting between two people who had never, ever spoken before in their lives. After months of investigation, the L.A. County coroner finally issues its report on the death of Lana Clarkson. Dr. Pena was unequivocal in, in his conclusion that this was a homicide. He found no suicidal tendencies in Clarkson's background. To him, this was uh, an open and shut case. The Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office formally charges Phil Spector with second-degree murder he remains free on a million dollar bail. Everyone knows what the consequences are if a gun is discharged, accidentally, intentionally, or whatever. For it to have discharged meant his finger was on the trigger. As the case heads towards trial, Spectre replaces Robert Shapiro with Leslie Abramson, who defended Eric Menendez at trial for murdering his parents. This man, was tasered in his own home, thrown to the ground at the foot of the poor deceased Miss Clarkson, 
the broken Hugh Millie. nose and two black eyes and 50,000 volts of electricity shot through me, unarmed, invited the police into my house. He wouldn't keep his mouth closed. He would actually show up at press conferences with her and start directly haranguing the press, and she would just be begging him on camera to be quiet. When Phil kept interrupting and correcting the renowned Leslie Abramson, I knew that she wouldn't be his defense attorney much longer. He needed the perfect lawyer to deal with his personal idiosyncrasies. Not everybody was going to be able to deal with Phil Spector. Abramson is dismissed, and Spector finally settles on famed New York City lawyer Bruce Cutler. Bruce Cutler successfully defended mafia boss of the Gambino crime family, John Gotti, three times. Cutler has a, a great reputation. In fact, when you're getting cross-examined by Cutler, it's called getting brucified. Philip was very involved in his defense. Uh, I would say far more than uh, most clients. The defense was is that this was a suicide situation. That was our belief. We held firm to that from start to finish. As Specter pleads his case to the public, it's clear there's only one wronged victim in his mind. He paints himself as the innocent target of a rabid regime. The actions of the Hitler-like district attorney and his stormtrooping henchmen to seek an indictment against me and censor all means of me getting my evidence and the truth out are reprehensible, unconscionable, and despicable. There is a part of me that thought that as difficult as this period of Spectre's life must have been, he was secretly enjoying being back in the center of the story after several decades on the sideline. My bags were packed. This was going to be the most captivating trial since OJ, and I wasn't going to miss it for the world. I checked into the Chateau Marmont, my favorite hotel in Los Angeles, and quickly headed over to the courthouse. Spectre had always worn toupees, and he had a new wig for this trial, a blonde page boy cut. When he appeared every day in court with his new 26-year-old wife Rochelle on his arm, they made a very theatrical entrance. Quiet down, ladies and gentlemen, please. Thank you. The state's case is in the hands of veteran prosecutor Pat Dixon and Alan Jackson, the rising star of the DA's office. The evidence is going to paint a picture of a man who on February 3rd, 2003, put a loaded pistol in Lana Clarkson's mouth. You're going to be introduced to evidence of the defendant's very rich history of violence against women, against uh, a history of violence involving guns. You're gonna be introduced to the real Philip Spector. The prosecution was, was arguing a common sense argument. You have two people in a house, um, one of them's dead, one comes out carrying a, a, a gun in his bloody hand. All of that evidence taken together will give deep meaning to the defendant's own words, his own confession. I think I killed somebody. In a pre-trial hearing, the prosecution won the right to introduce statements made by Spector following his arrest. But in a surprise tactical move, Jackson never mentioned Spector's statement. That just gutted Cutler's opening statement. The prosecution decided not to use any of Spector's statements on the day he was arrested because some of them supported the defense. The only way they could get them in was putting Spectre on the stand and letting the prosecution cross-examine him. The defense team's entire opening argument was based around the content of those statements. Now, in open court, they're forced to improvise. Uh, it is now, at least for me, has been changed drastically. Uh, so I feel like my pants are down. It was astounding. It was a bombshell. And then he asked for a recess, and the case recessed for overnight. I don't, I, I don't know how to... Uh... After Cutler's opening stumble, the defense regroups and lays out their suicide theory. 
The defense's argument was that a deeply neurotic woman had accepted an invitation to have a drink with Phil Spector. When she glimpsed a gun in uh, Spector's foyer, she grabbed it and uh, she shot herself. The defense story felt implausible to me from the start. They were running on empty and the trial had just begun. During a break, I made for the men's room. It was empty except for one person standing at the center urinal. It was Spectre. He had opened his Edwardian frock coat for the business at hand, and it billowed out on each side, half blocking the other two urinals, rendering them unusable. I didn't have the nerve to ask him to move his coat and free up a urinal, and I also didn't really want to pee next to him. So I waited my turn in silence on the back by the sinks. He took great care in rolling up his sleeves and elaborately soaping and scrubbing his hands in very hot water the way I have seen germaphobes do after they've shaken hands. When he was drying his hands with a paper towel, he noticed me for the first time. When testimony resumes, prosecutors call to the stand several women who describe a similar pattern of violent run-ins with Phil Spector. And at that point, he took his right hand that was holding the uh, revolver and smacked me in the side of the head and said, I told you to get the F back in the house. I told you to take your effing clothes off. He didn't have the rifle anymore. He had a gun to my face, a pistol. He could have been romantic and been, but he, he did it by gunpoint. He wanted to rape me. He had um, his gun with him and he pulled a chair and put it in front of the door and said that I wasn't going anywhere. He walked right up to me and held the gun right to my face with just inches between my eyes and said, if you try to leave, I'm gonna kill you. What all these women said, that he didn't want them to leave when they wanted to leave, he was drinking, they were spurning his advances, and he was pulling a gun and pointing it at their heads. Cutler begins an aggressive cross-examination, but his brusque New York style isn't playing in L.A. You formed an opinion. Excuse me. Excuse, you Excuse me, Mr. Cutler. First of all, you will not yell and point at a witness in my courtroom ever. That's number one. Number two, I was speaking, and I have told you before, when I am talking, do not talk over me. Now you may proceed. Judge Fiddler really put the smack down on Bruce Cutler and chewed him out in front of the jury, uh, which is definitely not something any trial lawyer ever wants to happen. By maybe the third week of the case, he was pretty much sidelined. And then he got involved in some personal project for a TV show and said he couldn't be there anymore. Cutler's colleague, Roger Rosen, handles the women with a softer touch. All of them, to one extent or another, some more pronounced, were in love with Phil Spector. They adored him and they still had feelings for him. On the night of the shooting, Spectre went out to dinner with a former high school classmate, Rami Davis. Rami Davis testified that he had been drinking that night, that his demeanor had changed, it sort of darkened. She was very concerned by the amount he was drinking, and I think very diplomatically uh, asked to go home. Spectre dropped Davis off at her home then had drinks with another woman, Kathy Sullivan, at Dan Tanna's restaurant. Philip remains in the jovial, fun mood. He's, he's uh, upbeat, he's positive, things of that nature. Correct. And once again, over that two hour period, you didn't have any trouble conversing with him, did you? No. She did not believe he was drunk that evening at all. She was, you know, he was very polite, he was very kind. After Dan Tanna's, the couple went over to the House of Blues. House of Blues was the last stop of the night, and it was about 1.30, closing time's 2 o'clock. So they go upstairs and they head up to the foundation room where Lana Clarkson is working, hostess at the door. She stopped us and said, you can't come in here. Tell me about the conversation between He the two. said, do you know who I am? And she said, I can't hear you, and you're not wearing a badge. This is a private party. Doing her best to keep the riffraff out, 
Lana would commit another major faux pas, especially by L.A. standards. She didn't have the slightest idea who Phil Spector was and mistakenly addressed him as Miss. What irony. She thinks uh, he's a diminutive woman with this wig on. And uh, finally, another co-worker of Lana Clark's uh, takes her aside and says, you know, that's Phil Spector. He's this huge guy. He's got a lot of money. Upstairs in the foundation room, Spector ordered a shot of rum straight up. Sullivan just asked for water. According to the waitress, Specter was very upset with Kathy Sullivan for ordering water, and he told her to order an effing drink. But she didn't want a drink. She got water, and water was brought to the table. After his limo driver took Kathy home, Specter turned his attention to the foundation room's pretty hostess. He wanted Lana Clarkson to have a drink with him. She asked permission to have a drink with a customer and was told, no, you can't do that. But now that she's getting off work, she helps him to his car. He's literally stumbling. Lana Clarkson clocked out at 2.21 a.m. Little did she know, she only had a few hours left to live. And so, into the night, drove the plastered music mogul, the desperate actress, and the only man who could break the case wide open. Everyone following the trial was dying to know what the limo driver saw and heard that night, and his testimony would not disappoint. As the Phil Spector murder trial unwinds, the once confident defendant is starting to feel the heat. When we passed in the corridors of the courthouse, it was clear Phil had stopped speaking to me. There were no more nods or greetings or occasional handshakes. His wife, Rochelle, had also adopted a snippy attitude. I guess they realized I wasn't rooting for an acquittal. The most anticipated witness in the Phil Spector murder trial, his limo driver, Adriano de Souza, is finally called to testify. Adriano de Souza was the one guy who was with Spector from the very beginning of the night, and he was there throughout the shooting. The former Brazilian military officer testifies that Lana escorted Spector from the House of Blues out to his limo. He invited her to go to the castle. And what was her response? Uh, first was no. Uh, he insisted, let's go to the castle, let's go to the castle. He said the lady didn't want to go to the house. He knew that. But that she finally changed her mind and went. Lana Clarkson had told him, said, OK, just one drink. And that Spectre had said, yelled at her, don't talk to the driver. Did he appear to be drunk? Uh, yes. Did Miss Clarkson appear to be drunk? No. D'Souza tells the court that Specter and his guest sat in the back of the Mercedes watching the old movie, Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye. They arrived at the castle around 3 a.m. He goes back out to his car to wait for what he thought was going to be a short period because Lana Clarkson has said this is going to be quick. Shortly before 5 a.m., D'Souza says he heard a gunshot. And what happened? Uh, I heard a boom of a noise. Minutes later, Spectre emerged from the castle. At that time, he, he had a gun in his hand. Did Mr. Spectre say anything to you? Yes. What did he say? He said, I think I killed somebody. And D'Souza then could see the body of Lana Clarkson. He could see her legs, he could see blood and he's putting it all together quickly. He assumed she was dead, and he freaked out. He was just really upset. D'Souza's testimony seems to be the nail in Spectre's coffin, but defense attorney Brad Brunyon wastes no time trying to tear it apart. 
Part of the defense's strategy was to say that、um, the driver Adriano de Souza didn't understand English well, and that he misheard what Mr. Specter said. The defense thought that Specter may have said, "I think somebody is killed." De Souza remains composed during the intense cross-examination. De Souza came across as a very believable witness. Forensic and medical investigators testify that while no fingerprints were found on the gun, they believe that this was a homicide. Another person, not Lana Clarkson, had put the gun in her mouth and fired it, and that she was killed instantly. The prosecution then produces the jacket Specter was wearing the night of the murder, and enters it into evidence. There wasn't much blood on it. In fact, there was no blood visible. It was only when they did forensic tests that they were able to bring up through the chemicals tiny spatters of blood on his coat, on the arm of his coat. A blood spatter expert testifies that the location of these mist-like blood droplets put Specter in close proximity to Lana when the gun was fired. In other words, two to three feet of Miss Clarkson's face. Correct? Yes. It seems like a slam dunk for the prosecution, but now it's the defense's turn, and they're about to put Lana herself on trial. She had an ongoing, continuing financial problems. Correct? Yes. Difficulty in feeding herself. Yes. When you've got a he said, she said, and the she's gone, there's no telling where the trial will end up. She was not married. She had no children. Yes.、Um, her career was not where she had hoped it would have been at that point. Is that correct? Right. And she was getting older. Yes. To me. The blame the victim defense is almost like murdering someone all over again. Having once been a failure in Hollywood myself, I totally understand the kind of depression that Lana Clarkson must have felt. I truly suffered during my bad years from the snubs and the slights that failure invites. I was tempted to take the pills or jump in front of the train, but something always stopped me. I don't think Lana Clarkson would have taken her life. Phil Spector's multi-million-dollar defense team brings in some of the world's foremost scientists to testify that Lana Clarkson killed herself. It was my opinion at the end of this that most likely this is a self-inflicted wound. The physical evidence is that she had the weapon. She's the one who fired the gun. There's just no objective scientific evidence. You cannot say he had the gun. It's speculation. He didn't have the gun. Beautiful women, and Lana was beautiful. Don't commit suicide by shooting themselves in the face. A blown-out mouth with teeth all over the floor is not a pretty look. No beautiful woman wants her body to be found that way, and no caring, feeling woman would commit suicide in front of a man she'd known for only a couple of hours. Though logic doesn't seem to favor the defense's case, some of the forensic findings do. The most important piece of evidence was Phil Spector's coat, and it was analyzed and reanalyzed over and over again because it didn't have enough blood on it to suggest that he had been the shooter. So they said there's no way that he was three feet away. The defense's experts seemed to say that he was across the room, that he saw it happen, but that he was not a participant in it. The defense also focuses on Lana's state of mind. Lana's friends testified that she drank heavily, that she was despondent about her career, about the fact that she was 40 years old, that she was unmarried. The defense brought out some very convincing and damning emails、uh, and letters from Clarkson to her friends. 
saying that she was at the end of her rope, that she couldn't go on. It was very clear when we finished the defense that um, she was a very troubled person. Sadly, a very, very troubled person. She was under the influence of alcohol, and people do stupid things that they regret immediately. It appears to have been a stupid impulse. That's what it was. Oh, come on. Putting a gun in your mouth is a lot more than a stupid impulse. The defense managed to transform poor, lovely Lana Clarkson into a fame-starved depressive with nothing to live for. After more than four months of testimony, the jury deliberates for 12 days. Finally, the judge announces that they're deadlocked at 10 to 2 and declares a mistrial. The foreman felt Ms. Clarkson could have been ashamed or somehow despondent over the situation she was in that evening. Maybe she felt guilty about having had some kind of sexual encounter with Mr. Spector. And in that moment of being ashamed, killed herself. Philip was disappointed. I think he was obviously hoping that it wouldn't be an acquittal. A mistrial is the biggest disappointment. Everybody wants a verdict. Thirteen months later, on October 29th, 2008, a second trial opens. Alan Jackson remains lead prosecutor. There's a, a very different look on the defense side of the courtroom. It is Phil Spector with one attorney, Darone Weinberg, from the San Francisco Bay Area. In a risky move, Weinberg introduces more stories of Spector brandishing guns. You would think the jury would think, well, if he keeps pulling guns out on people, eventually it's going to go off. Weinberg's contention is that Spectre uses the guns as conversational exclamation points. It's the crazy world of Hollywood, but no one takes it seriously. The defense also introduces medical records revealing Lana's past prescribed drug use, alleging Lana was depressed. As a result of some severe headaches that she chronically suffered from, she took Vicodin and some other pain relievers and had a habit of drinking with those drugs in her system. The prosecution counters by putting Lana Clarkson's mother on the stand. She had gone shopping with her that day for shoes for her job at the House of Blues, and the point being that a suicidal person doesn't go out and buy new shoes. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Philip Spector, guilty of the crime of second-degree murder of Lana Clarkson. On April 13th, 2009, Phil Spector was found guilty of second-degree murder, a charge that carries a life sentence. In prison, they've taken away Spector's wigs, and his subsequent request to wear a hat was denied. Finally, he requested a yarmulke, and it was allowed. For True TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.